Coming up next on America. So we focus on America and the way forward and a reflection on veterans who serve this country proudly. America's Hope starts now. This is America's Hope from our global headquarters in New York City. Here's Kelly Wright. Hello, everybody. Welcome to America's Hope. Thank you for joining us this hour. We're glad that you're stopping by and listen, wherever you are, we do sincerely hope that you're safe and well, taking care of yourself and your family because you matter. Veterans matter to this country, and we all know it because we just recently celebrated Veterans Day. But tonight we're going to focus on one combat veteran who went on to not only serve as a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army, but then he moved on to become a member of Congress. We'll be talking to former Congress member Alan West. And then we'll hear a remarkable story from Heather Aiken, who talks about her father who was an author of a book called Infiltration, which talks about the illegal immigration along the southern border. But what's notable about her dad is that he was honored by the military posthumously, even though he was a civilian. But he's the son of a World War II hero who was also celebrated just before Veterans Day. Let's get started. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm joined now by Lieutenant Colonel Retired Alan West. He is a constitutional conservative, uh, and as his bio says, a Christian constitutional conservative. There is a difference. He's a combat veteran and former member of the United States Congress. He has served this country well. What you might not know about Alan West is that he was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, in the same neighborhood where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once preached and he is the third of four generations of military servicemen, all combat veterans, and on the heels of Veterans Day. Uh, Colonel, thank you for your service, and thank you for serving this country well as a member of the United States Army, as well as a member of Congress. Uh, you served in Iraq, you served in, uh, in, in quite a few campaigns, and, and now you're serving the country as the uh, chairman of the Dallas GOP, the Dallas County GOP. The, the results of this election, let's start right there. How do you see President-elect Donald Trump and the Republican Party fixing the woes of America? Well, I think, and it's good to be with you, Kelly. I think without a doubt that President Trump took his message to the people of America. And when you look at the electoral map from the 2024 election broken down by county, you see an incredible uh, red shift in this country because <laughs> He talked about the issues that are concerning the people every day in the kitchen table. He talked about the economy, the inflation, the gas prices, their uh, level of security, being at their domestic security when they're facing crime, the border security. And then also some of the external factors when you look at international relations and uh, foreign relations and that national security aspect, as well as I think one of the most important things that uh, people want to do, they don't want to be bothered in their families. They want to be able to raise their children. They want to be able to educate their children. They don't want to be told the government controls their children nor controls what type of car they can drive or appliance they can have in their home. So I think that his message resonated very well and now they've got to come back next year and they've got to get uh, a Senate and a House that is Republican as well and they have to produce. You know, you echo the sentiments that was expressed by Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who said that he believes the agenda is so important that all Americans need to get behind this. But in particular, the party that's in power to actually help the president-elect go on to do what his agenda is calling for. And therefore, the 119th Congress coming into office in January will have to be ready to do the hard work and the heavy lifting to repair the breach, if you will, in America, because we are still very much divided. How do you see us ending our political divisions and as well as our race, racial divisions? Well, I think one of the things when you look at the results of this election is not really about race, blacks, whites, Hispanic, Asians, 
and all the different machinations within the Asian community or the Hispanic community, uh, they came together and they said, without a doubt, is that we want a different direction for our country. We don't like the way that it's heading. We don't like the centralized government uh, power and control. We don't want to be ruled by elites. We want to be governed by the people that we elect. And I think that right now there's an incredible opportunity to really bridge that you know, racial gap or, or whatever gap. When you look at the fact that, again, old and young, Jews, Christians, Muslims, I mean, just an incredible coalition of people came together uh, and you look at that electoral map, that shows that this country is paying attention now to the things that affect them in their homes. And so I think that the best thing to bring us together is a policy agenda that will heal those wounds that people are facing right now after the past three and a half or four years. But unfortunately, Kelly, I just don't think that the progressive socialist left gets it. I mean, to continue to call people racist, sexist, misogynist, and all of these other things means that they haven't gotten the memo. And they're the ones that really need to do the soul searching about how did they have such a disconnect with the American people. You know, it's also a question about uh, what's happening in the faith-based community, because as you know, there are millions of evangelicals who made their vote known uh, to the public at large. Uh, what role does faith in American politics uh, play, particularly for a time such as this? Well, I think it's important that we understand you have to have righteous governance. And what do I mean by righteous governance? It, it is a government that respects the number one uh, first liberty that you have in the Bill of Rights was the freedom of freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. And I think there were some very big concerns, especially when you saw the young people that shouted out Jesus is Lord, Christ is King at the, uh, I believe in Wisconsin at a Kamala Harris rally. She said, you're at the wrong rally. Uh, that sent a huge message. But then also, again, the social issues, when you look at wanting to dismember babies all the way up until the time of birth or even let them die afterwards, that's not what the American people are all about. And that's not part of our faith walk. And that's not part of you know what our Lord uh, God believes in. Uh, but then also on top of that, some of the other things about, you know, we believe that uh, our, we are made in the image of God, but now all of a sudden we're told that you can remake yourself in whatever image that you want to be. And you're having these surgeons that go out there and do that, which is causing, causing irreparable harm to our children and to our grandchildren. So I think that's why the faith community came out and said, you know, we're getting too far away from, you know, our fundamentals, right, fundamental rights and freedoms. And we're getting away from a government that has now created its own religion, being at the same sex marriage, the transgender issue, uh, the gender dysphoria issue, all of these different things. And, you know, persecuting and prosecuting people uh, if they don't bow down and worship that. And that's not what people want. So I think that the evangelical, the Christian community got a wake up call over these past two and a half years. And then there's the issue in the classroom, as you know, throughout America, education has been front and center for so many parents uh, from different spectrums of life. Uh, and then in, in a place like Oklahoma, for example, they've created or instituted Bible curriculum in order to reintroduce uh, the Bible and its platforms and its tenets, as well as its values and virtues into the classroom. What's your uh, view on that? Uh, I think it's important. As a matter of fact, Louisiana, you know, put the Ten Commandments back into the education system. But go back and look at all of these Ivy League institutions. They were founded on Christian principles. They were founded on teaching the word of God and scripture and things of this nature. So as a culture, we have drifted away from that. Uh, and I think that that is what has hurt us. As a matter of fact, when you read Alexis de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, he talked about the faith of this country and talked about how people came together on Sunday. And he felt that that was really what made America a different place. This little fledgling country that has come together and was surpassing you know, the countries in Europe because they had that deep seated, deep rooted faith. And so I believe that the church does have a role. I think that uh, our faith does have a, a, a role in educating our young people. Because when I look at some of the things our young people are facing, the level of suicides that are happening with our young people, they need to understand that, you know, there's a God-shaped hole in your heart. And the only thing that can fill it is the word of God and not all these other things that the world is telling you to put in there. 
Yeah, and Colonel, on that note, when you speak about young people, uh, you know, losing uh, their lives to suicide as well as anxiety and, and mental health and then other f stress fractures, including fentanyl and uh, just the whole drug uh, situation, it's important that our young people have mentors. You know, Frederick Douglass once said that it's better to uh, raise strong children than to repair broken men. So that means uh, people who are adults and have been in the room where things have happened need to remember that there's a young America that is yearning to learn from them. Uh, what, what, what's your challenge to older Americans about reaching out to the next generation? I would tell you to go and read Paul's letters to Timothy. I um, mean, here was Paul in prison and he's writing to that young minister, Timothy, and all the things that he talked about to encourage him, that's what we have to do. Uh, and that's what, you know, I sought to do as a senior officer in the military was to teach, coach, and mentor young officers, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, what have you. But they are looking for left and right limits. They are looking for, for guidance. And, and I got to tell you that uh, I just saw my uh, youngest grandson get ordained as a minister in the Pentecostal church this past uh, Sunday. And guess what? He wants to be a chaplain in the United States Army, something that he had no desire to do. But, you know, when I was introduced to him by way of our youngest daughter, and now he is the father of my grandson, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to wrap our arms around uh, others, our young men, our young women, and we're supposed to live by example so that they can see that good, righteous example, and they should want to be that. I mean, I think that we've got to tell our young people, be a victor or not be a victim, be a champion. And I think that when in Christ, you can overcome all things and you can be a champion. What do you, what do you think has to be done in terms of, uh, you know, that uh, the president-elect Donald Trump is talking about, we may have to face a mass deportation to right the wrongs that have happened with illegal, uh, illegal immigration. You're right there in Texas, a place where people are on the front lines of this. Uh, talk to me about that, please. Yeah, we see it every day. And uh, I remember some people asked me, how do you look at illegal immigration from a biblical perspective? Well, if you recall, when God uh, cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, he placed an angel with a sword of fire there to make sure they couldn't come back in because uh, they were no, no longer legal residents of the Garden of Eden. And we have to protect our nation and sovereignty, and we have to abide by the rule of law. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, in good conversation with Tom Holman. And when you talk about this issue about deportations, this is about developing tiers, tiers that are based upon the, uh, the value of the criteria of domestic threats and national security threats. And when you have 1.5 million to 2 million gotaways, you don't know who they are, or where they are. When you have 25 to 30,000 Chinese single military aged males, 425,000 criminal illegal immigrants to include 30,000 rapists and murders, that's a great place to start. So the whole fear mongering about all of a sudden grandma's gonna get a knock on her door, that's not what this is about. What this is about is making sure that people in this country abide by our laws, abide by our rules and respect our sovereignty. And we do not put the American people in a situation where what we saw with Lake of Riley in Georgia, she was killed by you know immigrant, illegal immigrants or Jocelyn Nungary, who was killed by the uh, Venezuelan Trinidad gang members. We don't want to see our young men and young women, their lives being cut short, or anyone, any American citizen, by people that are criminally here illegally. Yeah, Colonel, I've been there to uh, Texas along the southern border, and I've talked to residents there, ranchers, housewives, uh, border patrol, and, and just average citizens, and they, uh, they are really looking uh, with a, an eye of hope and expectancy that uh, the new administration can do something to address the problem of illegal immigration. Because just as you've stated, they see a lot of people coming across the border, or have seen a lot of them coming across the border, uh, who uh, are young and perhaps up to sinister and nefarious purposes, and then f making themselves into the fabric of our society. We don't have a, uh, a trace of where they are. I want to take a break. When I come back, I want to talk to you about you, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, former member of Congress, a combat veteran. We're coming back with more in just a moment. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm talking to my guest, Lieutenant Colonel retired Alan West. He is a Christian con constitutional conservative, a combat veteran, and former member of the United States Congress. And as I pointed out in the first introduction, 
of Colonel West. He was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Some people call it L.A., lovely Atlanta. Uh, he was born and raised in the same neighborhood where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once preached. Um, what a legacy. I mean, so many people that I know who have grown up in Atlanta, they've gone on to achieve the things that they have aspired to do. As a young man, what was it like growing up for you in Atlanta, Georgia, and setting your sights on becoming the man you are today? Well, it was incredible. I mean, all the history that was there, the neighborhood is called the Old Fourth Ward neighborhood, an incredible neighborhood. And when you grow up in your elementary school, Our Lady of Florence Catholic School, which is at the intersection of Boulevard and Auburn Avenue, Sweet Auburn, as we called it, and right across the street is the final resting place of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Ebenezer Baptist Church. And uh, on the backside of our recess playground uh, was his boyhood home. And so when you're playing kickball, I mean, there are many instances I remember of, you know, the ball getting kicked over the wall and ending up in his boyhood home's uh, backyard. And we, you know, you have to go over there and pick it up and, and bring it back. And so when you talk about content of character, not color of skin, all the different things that he articulated, when you talk about being a strong Christian man, I, I mean, you learn those things, but more importantly, you learn them from your mother and father who grew up in those tough times down south and, and a father who served uh, in a segregated army in World War II as a corporal who challenged me, his second son, to be the first officer in the family because my older brother was an enlisted Marine who served in Vietnam. So when you have that type of environment, when you have that type of neighborhood, that type of community, people around you, and you have that solid foundation in your home with a mother and father, which many of our young black men and women are missing today because only 24% have the mother and father in the home. That puts you on the right path. And part of that also is getting that good quality education, which unlocks all doors. Colonel, uh, you, you said something in there uh, about the fact that so many young men are growing up fatherless. Uh, and, and the disparity is that it's mostly predominantly uh, black men who are lacking that father in the home. Talk to me about fatherlessness in America and, and how it's impacted you to the point you've reached out to help others understand that men have a duty and a responsibility to be there for their children, even if they're in an estranged marriage. Find a way to do the right thing. It's about responsibility. And that's one of the things that my father uh, put into me and, and my mother as well is that you don't look for excuses. You don't look for, as I remember when I went to airborne school, we had one of the uh, airborne instructors say, if you set the bar low, you're gonna jump low. And so I've never wanted to set the bar low for myself and, and anyone that's, that's around me. But I, I think without a doubt, when you look at what happened to the black family, uh, you can trace it back to the Great Society programs of Linda Baines Johnson, when the government comes in and decides it's going to award women that have children out of wedlock with a check. And there's no you know, constraints or restraints on that, no matter how many children that you have. And you basically told young black men in the urban centers that you're no longer, lo no longer responsible for the most important thing, which is creating life. And so you ceded that over to the government. So I think it's so important that we have the policies that support families, good, strong, traditional nuclear families, especially in the inner city communities. Because I got to tell you, Kelly, if I ever came home and uh, my pants were down around, you know, my buttocks where my underwear was showing, my dad would have slapped me stupid. Okay, it just wasn't going to happen. And, and I will never forget that the biggest beating I got from my dad was when I was down south in his hometown of Cuthbert, Georgia. And I came home, and as I was walking home to granddad's house and he was there, I didn't speak to all the people that were sitting out on the porch. And they knew that I was, yeah, that bad juju. They knew I was Buck West boy. And, and I walk in and he lays me out. And I'm thinking, what did I do? He said, you disrespected me because you did not speak to these people and say, you know, hi, ma'am, sir. From then on, I got it. And so even to today, you know, when I meet you is hello, sir, hello, ma'am, until, you know, I become acquainted with you. And those little things are so important in the development of our young men, especially when I talk about honor, integrity, and responsibility. Yeah, it's also uh, duty and valor. And, and you uh, brought these home skills, this home training into the United States Army. 
and you wore that well. You served in uh, Operations uh, Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm, uh, which led to your uh, career as a battalion commander of the 2nd Battalion, 20th Field Artillery, 4th Infantry Division, and uh, you were deployed to Iraq as well. Um, when you're in combat, it's a different, different kind of service, sir, because then you realize that you are responsible for a lot of people within your unit and battalion, and yet they're in war. You can't protect everybody, but you're, you, how do you encourage people at a time of war to understand that freedom ain't free and you're actually protecting, putting your life on the line to protect the freedoms we value in America? Well, I will tell you that one of the things that I taught my troops before we deployed over in Iraq when I was a battalion commander, that the most expendable person in the battalion was me. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that they were well trained, they understood their task and purpose, and they could carry on regardless of what happened to me. And I always wanted to make sure that I never took credit for the things that they were doing, but I took responsibility. And they saw that and they understood that, that I was a person and a leader that was willing to lead by example. But I'll tell you probably the greatest conversation I had before we deployed was with my chaplain, uh, Ken Sharp. He was a brand new chaplain to us, a first lieutenant, Presbyterian. And uh, we were at the railhead loading up our equipment to go over to Iraq. And he came up to me and he said, you know, Colonel, I got to talk to you in, in private. And I just want to express you, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, Chaplain, you don't have a choice. I said, because you are a man of God and you're supposed to be able to do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. And furthermore, when we get into a combat situation, our men are going to be looking to you to, to help them through some tough times. And you have to be there for them. And he understood, and, and I will tell you, you know, in the beginning, he was very apprehensive, but as we got through the midway of our tour, I mean, the next thing you know, he's going out there praying with our troops before they go out on patrols, and then all of a sudden, he's going out on some of these missions with them. And, and I got to tell you, having that hedge of protection around your soldiers is so important, that, that peace that transcends all understanding is so important. So again, coming back to what we talked about in the early segment, faith is a really important foundation, not just for this nation, but for us as individuals. Colonel, thank you for sharing that. That's a, a huge insight into the depths of, uh, of your soul and, and, and how you led uh, so many uh, men, uh, even in harm's way in combat. And thank you for your service. We say that a lot, but having served in the Army myself, it, it would have um, been great to serve uh, in your command. I gotta ask you, uh, he wanted to serve in Congress as well, and I've had a habit of saying, you know, Congress needs some CPR, Congress performing responsibly, and yes, resuscitation of, of America's uh, values. Uh, having worked on the inside of Congress, what do you see ahead for Congress? We've talked about this before, but talk to me about the heart and soul of what congressional members need to take uh, stock in. The Constitution, you know, I took an oath, you took an oath to the Constitution. Uh, our military is unlike any other military. We take an oath to the thing that embodies us, brings us together, binds us as a people, and that's our rule of law. And those legislators are supposed to do the same thing. And so it can't be about their own self-interest. It can't be about special interests. It has to be about the American interest, and it has to be about adhering to the rule of law. And when we adhere to the rule of law, everything's going to be fine. You go back to Joshua in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, when God told Joshua three times to be strong and of good courage, he said, this book of the law, you shall not turn from it from the right or to the left. You shall meditate it upon it day and night. And as long as you do, you'll have success and prosperity wherever you go. And, of course, he was talking about the book of the law that he had given to Moses. Well, we need to meditate upon the book of the law, not just the, the Bible, but also the Constitution. Not saying that we make ourselves into a theocracy, but understand that natural rights theory, saying that the creator of God endows us with our life, our liberty, our property, those, those natural rights, that traces right back to understanding that foundation of faith. And if we get people that understand that they're supposed to set the conditions for the success and the prosperity of the American people to protect and preserve their life, their liberty, their property, their pursuit of happiness, I think the greatest days of this country are ahead. Are ahead. Congressman, uh, thank you very much. And what's your hope for America? 
my hope for America is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I think we're waking up to understand that. And Romans uh, 5, 3 through 5 uh, talks about how trials and tribulations produces perseverance. Perseverance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. And so I would just say to everyone, go back and read Romans 5, 3 through 5. And that's where our hope should be. God, thank you, my friend. Thank you for joining us uh, on America's Hope. I appreciate you so much. You know, I'm grateful for your service. And uh, while we celebrated Veterans Day earlier this week, it should be Veterans Day every day. Uh, so no, thank you right. once again. Lieutenant Colonel retired Alan West, former member of Congress as well, and still serving this country proudly as an American citizen who cares about you, America. We're back with more in just a moment. Hello and welcome to America's Hope. I'm joined now by a guest who is going to talk about her dad and her, and it's a tribute to her father because her father, Lee Dotson, wrote a book several years ago called Infiltration. And it actually pinpointed almost with accuracy about some of the problems along the southern border of the United States. You see, in Infiltration, he wrote how there would be attacks along the border from drug cartels, it would involve trafficking of drugs, trafficking of people. And he wrote this book years before it became part of the American lexicon as we talked about immigration throughout the campaign. And so Heather Aitken is here to pay tribute to her father because he's the son of a World War II veteran who was a hero. And it's an unusual story. And Heather, thank you for joining us to share insights about your dad and about your grandfather who served in World War II. Let's, let's begin with um, your father and why he wrote this book, Infiltration, uh, that was so ahead of its time in terms of the, the problems that we've seen along the southern border with regard to people infiltrating the country to spread fentanyl, human trafficking, and drugs. And crime. My dad seemed to be way ahead of his time. I don't know if you want to call him prophetic or creative. I have been told he is, was he involved with the CIA? Was he part of the FBI? I asked him those questions and he said, honey, I can't tell you anything because if I tell you, I can't keep you safe. So I don't know. <laughs> um, I know that the book was very important. Um, and he actually wrote the book in 2003. The book sat on a shelf till 2012, almost 2013. And um, actually, that's when I started bugging you to read the book. Um, and but um, people started reading it and they were like, OK, this is good. But, you know, it didn't get a lot of traffic back then because people weren't as concerned about the borders in 2013. But for some reason, my father was. Um, as you know, Kelly, you met my father. Um, he was one of, he was very compassionate. He had a lot of passion and he liked people. Um, he was the American boy. He, you know, he was the sole surviving son of a World War II hero. He was able to, you know, he went to school in Texas. And so he knew the area, especially like El Paso. He knew El Paso. Um, so when he sat down to write infiltration, um, he sat at a computer in the San Fernando Valley in California. Um, and he just, he started writing it. It starts off, with, with action of someone infiltrating the border. And when you read it, it seems like a, a Hollywood movie. But uh, so that's probably why a lot of people thought, well, it's just fiction. But then when the situation on the border became present uh, day understanding of what we were facing along the border, um, the book, uh, again, seemed to be very prophetic about some of the issues happening there. Unfortunately, my dad passed away last year and he missed all this timing of the book. 
because right now is the best time for this book because it tells a story and people are listening and they're going, wow, you know, and I mean, even to the point where I have FBI agents going, he even knows how they walk through these, these, these areas with, when they're touching the leaves on the ground with their feet. I had a Texas Highway Patrol, and I'm probably saying that wrong, and he'd probably kill me, but I was in a Target, and I was walking through Target, and this guy calls me out of the blue, and he goes, I just wanted you to know that everything that your dad said was correct. And I said, well, what did he say? He says, Heather, I can't tell you, I'll lose my job. Well, nobody's telling him. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's very but, hard to do. But to be clear, the, the hero in this book is a, a U.S. veteran. And we celebrate veterans because of what they've learned and what they know and how they continue to protect this nation even when they're no longer active duty. So the veteran in this page turner is really someone who alarmed and sounded the alarm for America to understand what was happening along its southern border. And certainly it goes to the core of the fact that there are many veterans along the U.S. southern border who are sounding an alarm about the issues they've had to confront on the border. Talk to me about the hero in this uh, particular book. Okay, first of all, when I read the book, it had to be my, of course, it had to be my dad, right? Who was the hero? Like, I'm, I'm reading this going, okay, that's dad. That's something dad would do. Um, but um, the guy in the book is there to protect um, a couple of other characters in the book. Um, he is rugged. He is, he is the American citizen that everybody would want in his, their corner. If, if stuff comes down, like it comes in, that's in the book, people would want this guy in their corner. A, whether it's a family member or a neighbor, if you read the book, you find that guy in your neighborhood or in your family and you go, I want to be with him because he's the one that's going to take care of me. So that's what struck me about the book because when I visited the southern border to, to tell some stories for America's Hope, I spoke to ranchers, I spoke to citizens, I spoke with housewives, I spoke with prosecutors, and all of them reminded me uh, of the scenarios illustrated in your father's book that he wrote about. And I thought, my goodness, you know, how forward thinking he was and prophetic he was. Uh, look, uh, the book is still out there. there. There is some talk about turning it into a Hollywood uh, movie. Uh, not that many people need Hollywood to see the, the, the dramatic issues along the border and, border and why immigration has emerged as such a, an issue that has to be dealt with regardless of whose administration is uh, r helping to run the country. But your father, after he passed away, you wanted to bring honor to him, and, and U.S. veterans actually reached out to help you honor your father, as well as your grandfather, a World War II hero. What happened? When my grandfather passed away, my dad was 11 days old. And um, my grandfather was one of 38 planes in England that went to Germany to take out a, an oil refinery. My grandfather was a B-17 pilot. He went in um, and he was one of the head planes in the group for the mission. Uh, and they started getting hit pretty bad. The flak was pretty bad. My grandfather, um, was his plane was hit on the left wing um, and the tail um, was taken off and he saw the middle of the oil refinery and he told his his crew to bail out they bailed out and he took the the plane down kamikaze style straight down into the middle and he blew it up and the, the other 37 planes came back he was um 
they said it was so tragic because he had just found out that he was a dad. Just just days before he had found out. They said the flack was so bad that you could walk on it. That's how bad it was. My grandfather was um, 22 years old. And um, they have been um, pursuing his, he was at that time, he was a lieutenant. And they have been pursuing his um, ranking up because he was supposed to go up to captain. This was in uh, September 13th, 1944, when the plane went down. It was MIA for almost six months. So I found out from my father before he died that he wanted to be spread in wide array over in New Mexico, in a little dinky town in New Mexico. So I made some phone calls to um, a congressman, uh, Congressman Mike Garcia, who happens to be military. I talked to um, the commemorative Air Force Base um, in Dallas and then Arizona. And they were also helpful. Um, I was able to get my dad's ashes spread from uh, the commemorative Air Force. People were able to get his ashes spread. We originally were going to use a B-17, but unfortunately with B-17s, they're old. <laughs> and so the plane went, couldn't, it was grounded. And then they tried to get a B-25 and the engine fell out. So they finally just got a, a small plane out of their own pocket. They helped me. And they spread my dad's ashes. And they and honored was, your granddad as well. In addition to your yes. father, uh, yes. your father did not serve in the military, but your no. grandfather did a World War II hero posthumously. And they yes. also, as I understand, uh, increased his rank uh, to yes. major. Uh, yes. What was your grandfather's name? Lee Dodson. He was the senior. And then my dad was Lee Dodson Jr. You're watching America's Hope. We're coming back with more after the break. So uh, fast forward to today and uh, people have now honored a World War II uh, hero who died uh, battling uh, Germany during World War II as a, a bombardier pilot, sacrificing his life knowing that he had just had a son, Lee Dotson Jr. And Lee Dotson writes this wonderful book about um, the incredible events going on along our border. And yet today, members of the military and veterans and the American Legion step forward to help you honor your father and honor your grandfather. Um, what does that say about uh, America's appreciation for veterans? And might I add, not just appreciation for veterans, but even appreciation for citizens like your dad, who never served uh, in the military, yet honored the military uh, in, in such a way. I wish there was more. I wish we appreciated them more. I wish there were more people to go give hugs to those children. Uh, that were without their dads, that were the gold star families, you know, like my dad was. It, 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 the, what happened to my dad, and what ha it happens all the time. And so, you know, we are going to be doing a lot of work here because I found that these things don't happen all the time. I'm going to be working with some of these guys to uh, get bills passed to help these kids because we don't do enough. We need to do more. These guys are giving their lives up for us and we need to help them. And my and you're speaking of gold star families. Yeah, they go way past what we can do, but we can at least help their kids and their families. Heather, what's your hope for America? <laughs> I'd love them to read the book. But I also would love them to, if your dad's still living, 
Give him a hug. I miss my dad a lot. Um, and I'm doing a mission for him that I don't think anybody else would probably take on because I didn't realize how big of a mission it was. But give your dad a hug and tell him you love him and, and know that these guys are there for you and the kids need to be there for them. Heather Aiken, we thank you for being on America's Help, daughter of a, of a proud American who wrote a book about infiltration on, along our southern border, who is the son of a World War II hero, uh, Lee Dotson Sr., uh, which made your father a Gold Star member. Uh, it's not something that people want to be a member of because it means the pain of losing a loved one in harm's way. But Heather, we appreciate you honoring your dad and we appreciate all of those members of the military as well as the American Legion out there in New Mexico honoring your father and your grandfather. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're back with more in just a moment. And welcome back to America's Hope. I'd like to thank our guests who appeared on tonight's program, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West and Heather Aiken both of them sharing their individual remarkable stories about how they love this great nation called the United States of America and the service that they have given to helping this country become great. But listen, as you've heard me say on this program before, the greatness of our nation actually begins in the homes of our people. And if home is where the heart is, what's in your heart? Maybe it's like the heart of Heather Aiken, who loved her father so much and her grandfather so much that she got them to be recognized posthumously for the service that they paid to America. Or maybe it's the heart of a champion like Lieutenant Colonel Alan West and former member of Congress, who still champions the cause of hope through his faith in God and country. Until next time, America, keep hope alive. God bless. In my America, my children are black and white. One shade of beautiful, so precious in God's sight. In my America, all lives are mad. So let's stop the chatter that tears us apart. We are a family together, you and me, agreeing to disagree, but still live in harmony. The dream that gives hope to us Is as strong as it ever was United we stand Divided we fall That's my America In my America There is no left or right we're all on common ground Darkness gives way to light In my America You give more than you take And when someone has lost their way You lend them a hand and say Together, you and me, agreeing to disagree, but still live in harmony. The dream that gives hope to us is as strong as it ever was. United we stand, divided we fall. That's 
my America. We are I'm not my brother's killer. But still live in harmony The dream that gives hope to us Is as strong as it ever was United we stand Divided we fall That's my America United we stand Divided we fall That's my America From sea to shining sea I believe in God I believe in you And I believe in we 